Welcome to today's webinar, Emerging Technology for the Australian Vegetable Industry. I'm Ian Thomas and I work for Ausveg as a project officer running the annual Vegetable Industry Seminars. While we've had people from all over Australia register for this event, I'm joining you from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and that sovereignty was never ceded. I would like also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, from wherever you are joining us today, Ausveg would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of your lands and pay the same respect to those communities and their elders. Uh, we have a great lineup of pre presentations today. Gary Leeson for Organic Crop Protections, who's running a touch late, will present on highly selective nucleopolyhedroviruses, NVPs, and other emerging insecticides. Benji Blevin from John Deere will be talking about precision agriculture and data management. Owen Keats from Hitachi Vantara will present on integrated farm management and remote monitoring software. Scott Fletcher from Ozpac Biotechnologies will be talking about cold, uh, cold storage ethylene control to improve product quality. And lastly, Jan Edwards from Incitec Pivot will be presenting on advancements in smart fertilizers. If you have any questions during the presentations, please ask them using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer all the questions in a uh, Q&A panel session at the end. After this, a short survey will pop up on your screen. I would be very grateful if you could fill it out. The results from the survey will be used to inform the organising of similar events in the future. Uh, this series of webinars is being funded through the Hort Innovation Vegetable Fund uh, from the Vegetable Levy. Uh, our first presentation today will come from, ah, and he's made it, Gary Leeson. Thank you for, for joining us, Gary. I'm sorry you had some issues getting in. Um, uh, our first presentation will come from Gary Leeson. Gary is the Innovation and Business Development Management uh, Manager at Organic Crop Protections. He comes from a third generation farming background and is trained in horticultural sciences. Gary joined OCP in 1993 and over 25 years built the company into a leader in the organic in farm inputs game. Uh, in 2018, Gary sold OCP to Yates Australia, where he continues to innovate and develop new products. He will be presenting on NVPs and other highly selective insecticides. So. Over to you, Gary. Thanks, Ian. I don't know whether I can, uh, hopefully I can share my screen correctly. Let's go, let's have a go at this. Can you see, can you see this? Yep, that looks great. I'll get all the uh, presenters to turn their uh, cameras off. Okay, is that working? If you could swap to um, uh, uh, the other view, go to display settings. Uh, display settings. Uh, yep, just there. Duplicate. Swap presenter view and slide view. Um, there we go. Perfect. So that's working. Yep. I'll just get Scott and Owen to turn their cameras off. Okay. All right. So yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I guess for those of you who don't know the OCP, I thought I'd just jump into a bit of background. Um, we've been around for about 30 years and, um, we've been operating the space of, I guess, integrated pest and disease management. Um, and we've been working closely with organic farmers, obviously, from the name, but a lot of our customers are also conventional growers wanting to obviously utilise our products in more of an IPM system. Um, four years ago, I, did, I sold the business to, um, to, to, uh, to, to Yates, um, which uh, um, now we have a, a, a very strong platform. We've invested $2.5 million in capability in terms of production locally, um, as well as now being a part of that Yates team, we... we we have the YE facility with the dynamic lifter business. Um, so we have a whole range of uh, soil conditioning agents and fertilizers in that organic space. So yeah, great platform. Um, in terms of in-house capability, OCP over the last 30 years, we've, we've developed a whole range of products, but also very interesting is the, is the tech partners we've brought on built forward over the, over the years. And the, and the two that I want to focus on today is really Andermatt Biocontrol from from uh, Switzerland and um, ISCA um, technology out of Riverside, California. Uh, and that's the biocontrol company that develop all the viruses, et cetera, the NPVs. And ISCA is um, focused on pheromones in the semi-chemical space. Um, in terms of Andermatt, they've been around for over 30 years. Um, they're an independently family-owned business. Um, they're based just outside of Basel in Switzerland. Um, they have a very strong global platform of manufacturing and over 500 um, employees worldwide. So a really, really interesting company. ISCA, as I said, out of Riverside, um, they focus on semi-chemicals, as I said, whole range of um, mating disruption products, attract and kill attractants like the bee pollination enhancement products. They have repellents, which actually act to repel insects and the whole range of monitoring and traps, et cetera. And they're also working closely with the Gates 
Bill Gates Foundation and looking at mosquito control utilising um, pheromones. So a really interesting group. In terms of obviously innovation pipeline, um, OCP have been working with, with, uh, with Andermatt. Uh, the two products we're going to focus on today is obviously the Helix of X um, and the Spotabia Plus, which is the two nuclear polyhedrous viruses. We also introduced Randex back in 2015, which is more for orchards with cobbling moth. In 2024, we're looking to introduce BV Protect, which is a um, entomode pathogenic fungi, which is a bacillus, um, no, not bacillus, a, um, Bavaria bassiana. And in um, and 2025, we're looking at uh, Nomia Protect, which is quite effective against, which is another entomode pathogenic fungi, Metarizum reilii, for the um, control of full armyworm, dimeback moth, and heliosis. So I guess just want to jump in a bit on the, on the backlog virus side of things, just a bit of a refresh for some, and some people might not really know these, these products, but backlog viruses are produced from basically mass rearing the, the pests that you want to control, and then you in, infect them with the virus that you want, you want to use. Um, then you harvest the virus and it's formulated and stabilised into, into, a, into a product and then quality controlled and bottled off. Um, in terms of what one of those very important steps in, in manufacturing viruses or producing viruses is the QA. And the Swiss being the Swiss, they, they, they really spend a lot of time and effort in making sure that their products are the highest possible quality by running these viruses through, um, through actual insects every time they produce a batch. So you guarantee uh, the viral counts and the quality of the, or, um, the viral nature of the product is maintained. In terms of mode of action, um, just like when you're producing the product, um, the virus is sprayed out on the crop, the caterpillars ingest it, it's dissolved and moves into the gut. The polyhedron um, occlusion bodies then dissolve and the virons are released, um, which then move into the cells of the, of the, um, of the insect. And over time, it just, the, the, they interact with the DNA and, and basically disrupt the, um, the skin of the insect. And then, then it just, um, it melt, the skin melts away and the virus escapes and, um, and that reinfects in the environment. So that reinfection process is really interesting. You can get what's called just the horizontal effect where we're just targeting the virus, where it's passing the virus on from one larvae generation to the next. But you can also get what's called the, the, the vertical effect where it's actually impacting on each, uh, each, each, each stage in the, in the morphology of, of, the, of the insect. So from, you can get the larvae effect, you can get the effect on the pupae, the moth, and the eggs. So you get this whole effect and fitness of the population as well. And that's where viruses are quite different to just straight spraying with a, with a toxic chemical. The other aspect, I guess, is important is that viruses are highly specific. So they only target the particular pests that you want to control. So in the case of NPVs with Spotavir and Helicovex, it's specifically Heliothus or Paul Army one. It will not impact any other beneficial insect. Even you know, products that are considered to be quite safe in the, bio, in, the in the organic space can have impacts on beneficials, but uh, NPVs do not. They're, they're very compatible with IPM. And they're also from a resistance perspective as well, the way the viruses uh, act, you get multiple generations within a few days that the insects cannot keep up with that, that change in the in the natural um, ability of the virus to change and, and, and there's no resistance issues with, with using these products. In terms of optimal use, um, the best time to apply these is straight after egg laying. Heliothus, for example, you know, they feed, they feed through the egg and they actually cannibalize each other in the early stages. So applying when the eggs, eggs laid with heliothus control is, is, is important. Not so much as important with, um, with, with um, full armyworm, but certainly with um, uh, heliothus. So the timing that needs to be around that egg laying up to L1, L2. Once they start getting larger than that L4, L5, L6, you, you're getting uh, beyond that um, ability to control up to you know, 60, 70, 80% of the population. Uh, you're getting down around 20%, but you still will get that, um, that effect of um, transferring the virus with those larger L5, L6s in heliothus control. Um, targeting of the pests is really important. Obviously, with viruses, um, they don't, you know, they're UV unstable. They like to be in, that can in the canopy away from the light as much as possible. So things like these drop leg application methods are quite effective in, you know, tight, dense crops like brassicas, for example, um, where you're getting that upward movement of the spray into the canopy, which is, which is really important. Um, application rates. So a high rate, there's, there's a range of rates for, for NPVs, but a high rate is, is used when you've got obviously the high pressure and you've got harvestable parts of the plant that you want to protect. Um, 
in a standalone application rather than with um, a tank mix or whatever. And, uh, and obviously in the case of high value crops, you want to protect it. So you want to use high rates. Low rates are used more in the low, low pressure environment, targeting vegetative stages and in tank mixes with other chemistry and in combination with shorter interval type spraying. Uh, application interval is short interval. So high when you've got high UV in summertime, uh, fast plant growth, um, fast increase of pest population, and, and long intervals when you've got low UV and sort of winter times and low plant, slower plant growth, obviously, and slow development of pest population, and rotation with other um, chemistry once again. Uh, in terms of UV, like I did mention, it's, it's sensitive UV, and the best time to apply it is um, early morning or late afternoon. So in full armor, when it actually seems to be that late afternoon is probably a better time to apply something like spotted ear. Um, in terms of temperature, um, it's, it still works in good temperature range, but when you get up around 35, you probably won't be, need to be spraying anyway. Rainfast, it's very rainfast, like viruses. Um, the polyhedron um, occlusion bodies are really, they really stick to waxy surfaces. So in the case of our product, the way that in the way it's formulated, you do not need to use an additive, a you know, sticker or a spreader. Um, it's very effective and very rainfast within now. In terms of storage, that's one of, I guess, the, the points we need to really consider is that it's stored, it needs to be stored, it's a biological product, so it needs to be stored in, in the fridge. Um, it can be up to two years at five degrees or lower, um, and it lasts for about a month at around about 25 degrees. <clears throat> Compatibility-wise, it um, has a reasonable pH range of five to eight in tank mixes, but, um, and it's highly compatible, like, and, and certainly the viruses, they're, they're completely compatible with each other, so mixing. Helic of X with spotted beer plus, you can do that, no problem at all. But always be, don't tank mix with copper because copper is a very strong biocide and it does impact on viruses. So um, as a summary, back to viruses can be tra um, transmitted in subsequent generations into other larvae in the field. So it's about population management. Back to viruses act specifically, they are fully compatible with beneficial insects and no resistance issues. So excellent IPM tool. Uh, back to viruses are resistant management tool as a standalone or as a tank mix. So it weakens the population to make them more susceptible to other chemistry as well. So, you know, re really great tool to use with other, other chemistry. And baclavirus is a safe the environment and uses and, um, and a really great way to protect the insect biodiversity. Just quickly moving on to the ISCA innovation pipeline. As I said, we've been working with them now for where, probably about eight to 10 years. We've introduced all their range of traps, a really interesting range of innovative traps, et cetera. You see a little net one there, that's quite a good poor armyworm trap that we've been developing. Um, and the whole range of lures are really good quality um, lures. So from a monitoring perspective, great company to be working with. Um, we introduced the Splat um, mating disruption product and we're working on others at the moment, but this is the first one for live and apple moth. Um, in 2018, we also launched the um, Apis Bloom Pollination Enhancer. Um, which is quite an effective product and also uh, of interest to veggie growers, you know, that are certainly melons, for example, where we're interested in improving pollination outcomes. Animed, which is a uh, fruit fly, it, it's a really interesting product. It's first to have both a med fly attractant as well as the Queensland fruit fly attractant. And we're finding it's lasting up to twice as long as um, the standard baits that are used for fruit fly control. So it's really interesting. Um, Actra FAW, this is, a, this is a moth attractant, which we're working on as well. Uh, you can see there the way that it's applied. Um, it's just applied every 30 metres with the toxicant, uh, incorporated into the attractant, and that controls the moths. And finally, just on the splattergator side of things, um, we've developed a machine that can actually um, put uh, splat material out the apis bloom and other major disruption products very quickly up to 10 hectares per hour, um, and you can still, but you can still buy the canisters, um, the cork and gun sort of method, but really effective way to get it out. I'll just quickly show you the spider gun machine. So yeah, that basically puts the, um, the apis bloom out into, into tree crops, but it can be modified to put it out into vegetable crops as well. So yeah, so that's the OCP range. Um, in the semi-chemical and biological space. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Gary. It was a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, our second presenter today is uh, Benji Blevin. Benji is the Precision Ag Manager for Australia and New Zealand uh, for uh, John Deere and is responsible for bringing new technologies and products into the Australian market.
In this role, he also identifies local trends and opportunities for Australian agricultural industries. He'll be presenting on precision agriculture and data management. Take it away, Benji. Thanks, Ian. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. And screen's showing up? Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benji Blevin. I'm the Precision Ag Manager for John Deere Australia New Zealand. And thanks for the opportunity to present to you all today. Uh, a quick, quick background on myself before I get started. I was born and raised on a tobacco farm in Zimbabwe and, and have been around farming uh, for most of my life. Immigrated to Australia in 2003 and, and studied mechanical engineering um, before joining John Deere and have been with them for seven years and involved in the precision ag space in Western Australia, Queensland um, and Northern New South Wales as well. So today I uh, just wanted to talk a bit about what technology is available on farm uh, currently, you know, where we're headed into the future um, and, and a few steps on how you can get started with some of the technology that's available um, today. So beginning with where we are uh, right now, um, how does that physical and digital world intersect on farm today? How are we using technologies to do more with less and, and how can it provide value on farm? So to start with this, this diagram provides a bit of a conceptual or visualization of how um, equipment interacts with, with yourselves and farmers and, and how information is transferred. So machines, as they pass through the field are collecting uh, equipment data and agronomics data. So things like fuel usage, uh, engine speed, um, speed and, and also agronomics. So if you've got things like a rate controller installed on a sprayer, it'd be collecting things like as applied maps, um, as applied rates and collecting that and, and presenting it visually in a, um, a farm management platform. So our platform is called the John Deere Operations Center. Um, uh, data gets collected, it's placed into the cloud and the operation center is where you interact, interact with that information, um, both the equipment data and the agronomic side. There's also the ability to send information back down to machinery. So whether that be what guidance lines you're using, what flags or hazards you have in the field that um, operators need to be aware of, or sending complete work plans or recommendations from agronomists on what needs to be carried out and what rates need to be applied. Um, and then on the top right hand side there, you can see connected advisors and software. So allowing and, and providing the controls and mechanisms for growers to be able to download export data, share it with who they need to. Um, so that could be an agronomist, it could be a financial advisor, um, providing the mechanisms to do that. And it can also be a third party platform if you prefer not to use uh, the operation center platform and you have another one that's more uh, suited to your production system um, or you know, something that you used historically, it's very easy to, to, to port that data to where it needs to go. So the idea, uh, I guess, and what we're trying to strive for is to seamlessly connect um, yourselves as growers with your equipment, the people that work on that equipment um, so that you can monitor the quality of the work being done and the data that that um, machinery collects so that you can derive value from it. And that, that en encompasses the, the whole digital farm. And I think when we talk about digital farming and, and precision ag, sometimes uh, it's, you know, can be seen as trying to change how we farm things, but it's, it's all about combining historical intuitive, um, sorry, um, institutional knowledge uh, that farmers have with data to, you know, back up, you know, things that you may already know about your farm and about the soil, about soil health, but enhance decision-making and provide comfort and uh, peace of mind and confidence with decisions moving forward. And so as a system, what is that workflow of engaging with precision ag technology and, and digital tools look like? And to start with, it's probably best to look at, you know, the physical workflow and, and, and how we've tried to make tools that suit and, and provide value in each of these physical steps. So, you know, before you do anything, it's about setting up that equipment, um, setting up machinery. So making sure that it's ready to go in the field. Operators know what they're doing. You're creating a plan for them to execute uh, on farm. And whilst they're doing that work, you're monitoring it, whether that be driving around in a ute or getting on the phone to, to make sure that the job's being done correctly, um, right place, right rate, right time, um, and then coming back at the end and analyzing the work that's been completed and, and understanding how you can improve moving forward. And in a digital space, it's, it's not too dissimilar. Uh, digital setup looks like, uh, what are my paddock boundaries or my block boundaries? What guidance lines am I using to travel through the fields? Uh, what rates and products am I going to be applying so that you don't have to manually record those things? 
it's planning jobs digitally and deploying them so that everyone has visibility at the same time to see where the progress is and um, you know when we need to plan to move forward and, and move on to the next thing. Monitoring becomes remote, uh, understanding exactly where a machine is and positioned within the field and, and getting real-time information about what rates and what speeds uh, someone might be doing in the field. So what is that indicator that is key to the, the, the quality of the work that, that is being completed and monitoring that remotely so that you can take action before um, the whole job is completed and, and you have to make that, um, you've made that mistake through a whole field, for example. And then it's reviewing, you know, on the analysis side, you've, you've collected a whole bunch of information that could be as basic as, uh, as, as machine data, but it could also be spray records and, and even yield um, if you're using you know, um, a yield monitor in a root crop, for example, and identifying what, what variability you have in the field and, and trying to move towards a variable rate program, for example. So that, that digital workflow is really enabled through some core foundational technologies that have um, become embedded in a lot of uh, equipment over time. So on the left-hand side is a, is a display, an interface in the cab of the tractor to um, allow you to, to, to visualize where that machine is and um, and the work that you've been done that you're doing and setting up in the field, a GPS receiver collecting you know where you are and and mapping that uh, in the paddock, JD Link connectivity. So that's a picture of a modem um, which allows your machine to be connected to the operation center platform or for another provider it would be something else, but connected to the cloud so that data can seamlessly flow between them, and then the platform itself. So those those kind of four foundational technologies are what enable that workflow and, and for that system to really um, work well. What I wanted to focus a little bit in, in on today specifically is around connectivity and the operation center platform and some of the, uh, you know, some of the really easy steps you can take around um, what connectivity enables you to see and how it can improve um, or enhance how you monitor your farm and, and operate it. So this is, a, I guess, a visualization of the app itself. The first uh, video here is setting up and planning. Um, here we're selecting fields that we're going to be working on. We're selecting the crop type in this example that we're going to be planting. Uh, what rates will we planting at? And you can do that for individual fields or across the whole farm. You can also select a product to apply at the same time um, and, and what rates you'd be applying that product at. That can also be done um, at the individual field level. And then you can define what guidance lines you'll be using. Uh, and you, know, you can also select which would be the priority and deselect any that you don't want operators using. So uh, that you're, you know, you're making sure you're on the right run lines. You can define um, equipment and operator, and you can also send custom work notes and instructions for those operators that um, will be working. You can send that wirelessly to the machine and the work then can be completed and uh, everyone is on the same page about what needs to be done. From a monitoring perspective with connectivity on equipment today, you can now start to see things like how many acres you've completed of, of the total field you know, size. And then there's also analytics to allow you to predict how many minutes um, it'll take for that field to finish based on the current speed and productivity. And just recently released, we've, um, and you'll have to excuse the broad acre example, but the, the same, uh, I guess, indicators will be relevant for, for veggie growers as well, where connected equipment will start to show you exactly what productivity and speed they're, they're traveling at. Um, if they are idle, it'll start to count up that how, how many minutes they've been idle for. Uh, and those, those machine positions in field are being updated every five seconds. So you're starting to get it quite close to near real time updates of position within the field and, and progress. In the, in the platform as well, um, some of the things that you can utilize on the, on, on, the, on the platform on the web version, and you can see here is a machine during the course of a day where it's traveled and where it's worked. And then on the left-hand side, uh, the utilization of that machine through the day of, of working versus idle versus transport and the hours of operation. All of that can be exported um, into an Excel spreadsheet if that's where you do your analysis for things like fuel usage. Um, some of the other categories you can look at, you can expand a date range right beyond you know, a month, two months, six months to understand what that utilization looked like over a longer period of time. And you can also look at 
uh, alerts and trouble codes that the machine has has fired over time, and you can filter those for you know whether it's critical alerts or or um, just medium or, or low low priority. And then finally, maintenance. So you can schedule uh, maintenance plans for equipment, and based on the hours as they tick over, uh, it'll it'll tell you when that service is due. And it can also give you information about what steps are required. So for example, on this 500 engine hours service, what steps are required at that service interval and what parts would be needed uh, to be ordered to conduct that service interval. And uh, the, other, the other neat tool that you can use if you've got a, a larger fleet, uh, you can start to do some equipment performance benchmarking and compare you know, things like uh, working transport and idle time so how efficient are operators being on different pieces of equipment that may be performing the same task and is there an opportunity to drive efficiency across the whole operation you can also look at things like average engine load factor speeds uh, engine speeds across different operations on the farm to to really understand and 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 dial in um, the operation as a whole So looking uh, slightly further forward, what's shaping the future? And I think we see five key technologies um, being sensors, data, connectivity, AI, and robotics. And, and sensors are becoming more and more advanced and they're collecting more information. That connectivity is obviously foundational to allow that information to transfer to a cloud-based system where AI and machine learning can implement uh, a decision and, and put that on farm. So we, we have sort of three pillars at John Deere to, to allow us to build smarter equipment and uh, enable better decisions. So they are you know, managing plant, moving down to managing every plant using those sensors and technology, simplifying farm management by providing the right information um, anywhere, anytime. And that was kind of some of that information I was showing on the, on the app there where we wanna bring up what's critical to that job quality. Um, is it speed? Is it rate? Is it productivity that you wanna see uh, as, a, as a machine is performing a task? and then harnessing the power of data and analytics. But I suppose in the hort, you know, viticulture, tree crop, hay and forage segment specifically, one of our key nearer term focuses is on connecting all small ag equipment with JD Link uh, to enable farmers to utilize some of these digital tools that I just went through a little bit earlier um, and really start to get engaged with uh, digital farming and precision ag. So, and what I mean by um, connectivity, technology coming to smaller machines it's a traditional four five and six series tractors and broadacre equipment sort of had this connectivity built in from the factory since 2011 and we'll be starting to bring that to um, some of our smaller tractors and enabling that experience uh, across our whole fleet we also know uh, connectivity is foundational for autonomy um, and having that real-time connection to an autonomous machine so that you can monitor the work it's completing and manage any exceptions that it encounters remotely. And I think if you look back when Autotrack started back in 2007, I think on, on an 8RT tractor uh, that when it was first embedded from factory, um, and now it's sort of available on all ag tractor models. So, um, and starting for, you know, we released the 8R and tillage specifically earlier this year in the US, and that made sense as it's a simple, you know, simple task. But over time, as our sensor capability and machine learning and um, AI improves, we'll, able, we'll be able to expand uh, autonomous machines to more complex tasks like spraying and planting. And you know, we'll see this come to horticulture farms just as, we, as, as quickly as we will see it come in Broadacre. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've made a commitment around um, an autonomous platform or autonomous tractor by 2026. So when we think about the grand scheme, it's, it's not far away at all. Um, and it, it's about just getting ready to um, utilize that, that technology when it arrives. So one of the key things about it is how you'll interact and manage that machine when it, when it comes and it's autonomous. It'll be through a digital platform, um, through an app on your phone, like I just showed before. And that's for us, that's Operation Center Mobile. And this is a bit of a, a mock-up of what that would look like. You know, you, you're, you're able to dial into an autonomous tractor, see the video feed from the work it's completing, monitor the quality of the work it's doing. And when it does encounter an exception, it's about providing a decision point for it to either, you know, proceed through um, a wet patch or drive around um, uh, an obstacle, for example. So moving away from not just the monitoring aspect, but an execution in the field with a piece of machinery. So getting started, um, a few just 
points I'd, I'd say to, to get started with, set up your digital farm, things like boundaries, guidance lines, um, collecting information. Those boundaries are really, really critical for capturing info in the right place and, and data in the right place, but also um, guiding machines through the field. Implement connectivity and infrastructure on your equipment um, and new machines, as I said, over time will come with that and leverage existing technology on farm that you have uh, and, and start to document data and, and gather insights. And for those that want to, uh, you know, Operation Center is a free, free platform. So uh, get engaged, uh, download it, see if you've got some tools there that will be beneficial for your operation. Um, it's just operationcenter.deer.com. You'll have to spell center with the US spelling. So apologies for that. And there is a QR code there if you'd like to scan it to take you straight to that website. But uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Ian. Thank you so much, Benji. As a, a fascinating suite of, of tools you guys are developing there. And it looks like they're pretty close to getting uh, deployable on, on farm for some of that more intricate operation stuff. Um, our next presentation today is going to be from Owen Keats. He'll be filling in for Dallas Gibb, who is advertised to be presenting. Um, uh, he, who is unable to make today's webinar, uh, Owen is the Associate Vice President of IoT, OT and Industry Cloud Practice at Hitachi Ventara. Owen has been with the company for seven and a half years and heads up the Smart Ag Division globally. He's current, currently completing a PhD in Digital Solutions for Agriculture and will be presenting on integrated farm management and remote monitoring software, which he is currently developing. Over to you, Owen. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Ian. Um, let's get this up on the screen. And uh, great presentation, Benji. I think it's a nice segue into, uh, in, into this section as well. It's all very, very connected. Um, one quick slide on uh, Hitachi. It's you know, obviously we're part of the big global corporate, but the, the important part is the, uh, the company invests in co-creation and R&D uh, 3.4 billion in 2020, and that's been the normal trend, um, and, and really embrace the uh, innovation. Uh, we've, um, Gartner have put us at the top of the magic quadrant in terms of the uh, IOT platforms for the last three years. And uh, we, we also are very invested in the UN sustainability development uh, uh, goals. Uh, where we've managed to even get one of our projects uh, that I'll be talking about uh, showcased last year at COP26. I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the, um, the Horticulture Innovation Australia project, which uh, was focused on digital monitoring and, and, and environment uh, in the Great Barrier Reef catchment area. We had several uh, partners involved uh, right across the spectrum, the peak bodies, um, and the, the, the project was. Uh, predominantly sponsored by the Australian Government and uh, National Land Care Program. Uh, key, key partners included uh, Applied Horticulture Research. With the farms that are involved are uh, bananas up, uh, bottle free of bananas up in Innisfail, vegetables, uh, Aust chili in Bundaberg. We've also got avocados out of uh, Bundaberg and a commercial nursery in Golden Grove in Torben Lee. We, we're running the project the last three years and we, we, we've, we've got a, a couple of years to, to go as, as we're now in a uh, sort of adoption phase. The, the uh, technology is fully deployed and has been so for the last year. What, in the early days, what the, um, the big request was for a, single platform to sort of combine the many, many platforms that uh, growers were, were having to access on a daily basis. And that is something that we, we really focus on, being able to integrate data and, and even share data with, uh, you know, with, with the platform of choice. So uh, we've just been talking about the John Deere Operations Center. You can just as well share the integrated data with, with such a platform or pull data from such a platform in order to to get the, the value of, of the complete suite of data for advanced analytics. And it's some of that advanced analytics that I'll be sharing with you that uh, you know, we've developed with, with each one of these producers in the, cost, in the course of the last couple of years. The, uh, the overall horticulture control tower now has six modules. 
There's the production module, which obviously looks at water quality and, uh, and planning aspects. One of the key re uh, requests as well was to automate best management practice compliance. And we've done that wherever uh, it was possible to sensorize the data and uh, ingest that data straight into a, a, a fresh care report, for example. Um, we've also extended out into the track and trace space uh, on request from, from the producers and have been tracking some of the devices, just like you've seen in the John Deere example, um, which is which is really provided a, a, a very significant productivity uh, improvement, as, as I'll share with you later. And also something that's extended out of the original scope has been the tracking of produce uh, to market and been able to trace back uh, to, in some cases, a single plant or a single, a single tree. Environmental management was uh, one of the core uh, objectives. And we've, uh, we've installed appropriate uh, environmental sensors, in, including an inline nitrate sensor in one of the farms, which uh, gives, um, is able to uh, constantly monitor nitrates leaching into, into the, uh, uh, the water systems. And that has had a, a, a very profound impact on management practices and been able to ensure that there's uh, all nitrate is actually consumed in, in, the, uh, in the root zone. And the confidence across these producers has now uh, improved to the point and grown and to the point where the request is now for us to close the loop. So we started with descriptive analytics. We moved on to some prediction. And uh, in the latest wave of development, we are now going to prescription, which has been able to provide um, information signal data straight to fertigation systems, for, for example which uh, significantly helps overall uh, productivity. Some of the um, benefits that have been documented uh, to date uh, on the irrigation management side, there's been significant improvements. Uh, the data is all available on a large touchscreen uh, TV in each one of these properties. Uh, the personnel team members involved with irrigation interact with, with it on a very, very regular basis. And, the, the whole management of water has uh, really improved quite significantly. And with that, of course, uh, uh, fertilization and fertigation. The ability to, to, to actually um, guide uh, assets uh, as well as team members to the right place at the right time through the tracking of, of activities has also led to a significant productivity benefit, especially in times of uh, of high demand around harvesting. The tracking and tracing has uh, uh, produced uh, some, some good insights and the ability to have that full provenance now through to uh, the distribution centers is, is of obvious benefit. And the, um, a key one has been the ability to uh, automate wherever possible the compliance reporting, because it, it was, a, an area of concern raised by the producers that there was a lot of time taken to compile the, the respective reports. Um, in, in the protective cropping side, it, it's, uh, you, you have the ability to, to even uh, have more, more sensors just, just because of the confined nature of the, of the space. And we've done a lot of innovation in that space, and even to the point of measuring leachate out, out of individual uh, plant pots and being able to pro provide feedback into the irrigation and fertigation systems. And I'll show just in the following slide, um, water quality is, is of fundamental importance to make sure the optimum uh, quality of water and then later fertigation is, is, is applied but also when it comes to leachate to ensure that uh, all environmental parameters are being properly monitored and uh, adjusted as required. Similar to what you saw on the, the John Deere example, um, all the information is brought together on a, a, um, a geospatial representation, which is fully customized. There's all widgets that uh, the individual producers can select or deselect uh, as, as, as they require. And you know, the, the, the geospatial representation just means that the insights can, can be um, 
assessed very, very quickly and, and the appropriate action taken um, in, in as quickly as possible. The, the important message around the uh, water usage and, and water monitoring is uh, once again, this is not a dashboard. This, this is an advanced analytical solution where you've got a combination of soil moisture sensor data in each zone within a particular paddock combined with the, the weather station. Each one of the properties has a, a weather station combined with um, weather forecast. All that data is brought together uh, with, with, with the appropriate uh, inputs around these requirements for the specific crop. And a recommendation is given as to when uh, irrigation or fertigation should occur. And that, that's a very powerful process. There's also a deeper level of science that uh, is applied. You know, the EC is measured together with the soil moisture. In some of the properties, uh, soil moisture is measured uh, at five different depths, as well as EC. And the electrical condu conductivity enables you to, to keep a close eye on salinity and uh, just provides another powerful um, decision support tool in, in the, the whole management of irrigation and, and fertigation. We spoke about water in, in some of the areas. Water is super critical and the, uh, the sources of water have to be very, very carefully managed, especially when multiple sources of water go into a dam. Uh, we have temperature sensors at numerous levels at, at, um, on, on the nursery, for example, just making sure there's no, we've been very, uh, having, having the ability to monitor for any temperature inversion and uh, make sure the appropriate alerts and actions are taken if that occurs, because that can have a, an impact on water quality. And uh, then monitoring the other components, both uh, being ingested into the uh, property as well as uh, water then returning to, to the river systems. And th there are deeper insights in, in terms of plant growth, even at a chili, uh, for a chili, we, we use dendrometers to uh, measure the, uh, the growth of, of, of the actual chili. Um, and we, we have dendrometers on the stems, for example, just monitoring the shrinkage uh, in, in the avocado, avocado, avocado orchards. So we're able to take dendrometer data, sap flow data where appropriate, and once again, just combine those into a decision algorithm that can provide advanced decision support. And the, um, the, the, the ultimate aim is to automate wherever possible. So we're now in that final stage of closing the loop and being able to automatically switch on the appropriate fertigation irrigation system. The, the other key point of developing decision support uh, solutions as opposed to pure dashboarding is the ability to set alerts and set thresholds. So, so when certain thresholds have been exceeded, a workflow is, is, is commenced and the appropriate personnel team members are alerted and action can then be taken, even triggered by the system. This here is just an example of the automation of one of the fresh care reporting systems, ingesting the appropriate data, transforming that data into the required format for reporting, and then publishing it into the, the required uh, repository for, for the report. So hopefully that was uh, of, of benefit. Thanks very much. And I'm gonna pass back to you. Ian. Thank you so much. Uh, th thanks so much, Owen. That's, um... Fascinating to um to to see how that project's coming along. Full disclosures to uh, all attendees. I I sort of work uh, in partnership with that project uh, in my role at Ausveg. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it looks like it's coming along uh, nicely. Um, very interesting what insights can be gathered there. Um, for our next presentation, Scott Fletcher will be talking about ethylene control within the cold storage chain to improve product quality and decrease food wastage. As technical manager for Ozpac Biotechnologies, his expertise includes systems and technology to remotely control ripening, gas detection, and airborne pathogens in cool room facilities. Take it away, Alan.
Uh, you're on mute, mute, sorry, Scott. And I did say take it away, Owen. I meant to say take it away, Scott. That's okay. It's unmuted now. You can hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, very good. All right, thank you, Ian, for uh, this opportunity to uh, be able to present with Ausveg. Uh, very kind of you to offer, and the, the panelists and presenters that you've got are just incredible. I feel like somewhat of a minnow amongst their company. But I would like to be able to, I guess, introduce you today and just talk briefly about a product called BioTurbo, um, which comes to the market. Functionality wise, it's really there to extend shelf life for post harvest produce in the, in the cold chain. Uh, it's presented by a company called Neotech, who manufacture BioTurbo in the US. And primary objectives are it extends the shelf life of post harvest fresh fruit and vegetables reduce wastage and improve sustainability and create a cleaner air environment for produce and staff who work in the facilities. The target actions of the product are to minimize the incidence of airborne pathogens and also ethylene gas cross-contamination in delicate post-harvest areas that house both fruit and vegetables. Essentially, wastage reduction is the primary goal of this type of a product. Uh, and the benefits are there for growers, transporters, distributors, processors, retailers, and then right through, obviously, essentially at the end for the user, and that being the consumers. The reasons for development of this technology initially, cool storage, it's, it's a very well-refined um, space. And across decades, the best possible results are achieved with delicate balance of temperature, time, and humidity control. Um, while each unique line of produce has an ideal setting to hold it, sometimes it can be practically difficult to, to accommodate this in every facility. And as such, um, sometimes we end up with maybe 30 lines of produce spread across two cool rooms of separate temperatures. The potential issues that occur with this is that we can get cross-contamination of ethylene sensitive produce with ethylene producing produce. Um, it's a simple gas, it's got a hormone action, and it's released by many lines of produce naturally, both in the field, but also post-harvest. Um, contaminants such as combustion engines and cigarette smoke are also sources of this gas. Now, very small amounts of ethylene can impact shelf life, appearance and the market value, not only of vegetables, but also fruit and uh, fresh cut flowers. So wastage essentially is a result and it can occur at any level of the post-harvest journey due to the actions of this gas. Now, if fresh produce has lost its main viability by the time it reaches that consumer level, then we're getting wastage uh, at the home. And that's basically, for example, say, perhaps you may purchase broccoli from, from a, a position and it may last one day beautifully in the fridge, other times it may last four days. So a little bit further prior to its arrival at the household, there may have been an issue with ethylene contamination completely from an unrelated line of produce. The, um, the national annual losses of produce are, are consistently well documented. Now, ethylene can be difficult and it's very expensive to measure actually at lower levels. It's obviously odorless and it's invisible. And for these reasons, it can be often overlooked um, throughout processes. There have been detailed ethylene samplings conducted across uh, 700 sites previously in the Australian cool chain way back in the year 2000. And studies involving Australian researchers with respect to the impact of these low levels um, on the shelf life of common produce lines can be easily accessed for review. Essentially, though, very low levels can impact shelf life significantly. So post-harvest ethylene exposure, some of the issues that you might commonly see flowering, loss of colour, or in broccoli, russet spotting on lettuce, bitterness occurring in carrots, asparagus, softening and pitting uh, in capsicum and zucchini, leaf yellowing, browning, wilting, and uh, dropping of flower petals, obviously in fresh flowers, this can also occur in brassicas, and premature ripening, softening, and rot, particularly in tropical fruits. Second issue uh, that I just want to touch on is that of airborne pathogens in cold chain. Uh, once again, they can obviously induce wastage, moles, bacteria, 
virus mildew can present randomly on occasion and, and ultimately reduce the yields due to offcuts uh, and even large portions of the harvested crop ending up as wastage. The onset is always unexpected, but it can impact the bottom line significantly across a period of, of say a, a year. Now bioturbo systems serve to address both ethylene and airborne pathogens, therefore potentially imparting an extra level of biosecurity to already generally excellent cold chain facilities. How they function? Um, there are a series of chambers. So chamber one, uh, tainted air from the room is drawn through a dust filter and passed through a coated mesh that serves as a, a membrane disruptor on airborne. Um, at this point, the airborne are already in trouble. Second chamber, ozone is generated uh, from O2 and is held at a density uh, in a large chamber. At this point, ethylene is broken down along with odors and other VOCs and uh, any remaining airborne pathogens are subjected to the well-documented sanitizing actions of ozone. Ozone obviously kills 99.5% of airborne pathogens. The third chamber that the Roo air passes through uh, contains a catalyst, and this converts any residual ozone back into O2. So essentially returning clean air back into the current facility. Small diagram here exploded, just showing you the, the travels of the air. It's taken from external to the device, through a dust and a debris filter, through the small cell disruptor plate. And then there's some beautifully crafted uh, glass metal ozone generator plates, which receive current. They disrupt oxygen, producing ozone. And then there's around a 20 to 30 second travel time through the ozone chamber for the room air coming back out through the catalyst before it's returned into the air. And that catalyst point, once again, is your O3 being broken down so that O2 is returning back into the room. Plenty of studies uh, historically have been performed with this type of thing, and some of them are very harsh, just taking reasonably poor quality produce, doing side-by-side -side trials with and without the bioturbo units, just to determine how much of a capacity it really does have to inhibit the spread of airborne pathogens across produce. And um, that's just a small example where it was done in Kenya with avocados. Essentially, you end up with improved air quality also for your staff. The system circle circulate room air 24-7 every day of the year. It's safe for staff to go about their work uh, and obviously clean out and fresher smelling air. Traditionally, ozone has been a little difficult because it's not the type of thing you want to just go flooding into open spaces where you've got staff working and in concentrations, it can be harsh on plastics and metals, etc. This type of system is completely different. At no point does any ozone actually enter the room that it's hosting its function in. Now, there's a number of different capacity sizes. Um, small units, they're by turbo 100, so up to 100 cubic metres. This may be used in research laboratories or very small rooms. Um, there's actually one being used in a cannabis uh, processing and drying facility at the moment. BT 300, BT 1000, so increasing the size of the cool room spaces they can handle. And then the very large units, the BT 6000s, or multiples of that. So it's scalable for quite enormous facilities. And currently in Singapore, there's a 100,000 cubic metre mixed produce cool room being completed. Just some illustrations there of the units themselves. Um, they're from very small, around about 70 centimetres in length for the BioTurbo 100 moving up to your big large bioturbo 6000 you're at around about 2.4 meters in length for this particular unit so where can they be implemented um, situations such as grower cool rooms long storage cool rooms imported produce cool rooms uh, which is one of the reasons it initially came about um, dealing through with imported produce in uh, malaysia and places like that Mixed produce distribution cool rooms where you get a number of different lines being housed together. Market produce rooms, processing and packing facilities. Cool transport vehicles. There is a 12 volt version available which can go into cool trucks and also potentially containers. Product research labs where you're working with say grafting facilities where you want your air as clean as possible or where you may be researching um, on storage factors and it's an ideal to have a control area where you've got minimal to no ethylene 
um, interrupting results. And then also wine barrel rooms, which can be often quite nasty in terms of the proliferation of mould that occurs in those rooms. Here's an image of a BT6000 just in position. Now, they're generally placed high in the room, attached to the ceiling via a template, and they just require standard power. So they're quite easy to fit to existing older cool rooms or new facilities. International usage, they're across 40 countries. Um, the facilities are varied and they include the protection of mixed fresh vegetables and market facilities, importers handling avocados, grapes, mango, kiwi and bananas, uh, long-term onion and garlic storage at grower facilities, ginger storage facilities, grafting laboratories for bananas and cannabis drying and processing facilities. So look, just to wrap up, the bioturbo systems, primary goal is extending storage life, uh, improves the lifespan and quality of stored produce by cleaning storage atmosphere of airborne pathogens, prevents premature ripening, minimizing rot, dealing with ethylene. It does obviously use the extremely powerful action of ozone, kills bacteria and viruses, prevents mold and fungi buildup. And that's just not on produce, that's also within the facilities themselves. So on fittings, on walls, you're looking at potentially their uh, minimizing the, the amount of cleaning that's required. So it's not so laborious. Thank you so much. Um, it's been great that I could have your time today. We'd certainly look forward to any discussions regarding how these units may potentially benefit any of your interesting facilities that are certainly out there in the industry. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Um, uh, fascinating piece of technology. Um, our final presenter today is Jan Edwards. Uh, Jan is the Director of Agronomy and Ideation at Instec Pivot Fertilisers, where she's working to develop new smart fertilisers to improve environmental outcomes and nutrient use efficiency. Uh, she'll be presenting on some of these developments uh, that they've been working on uh, in this area and some new products that might be hitting the market soon. Over to you, Jan. Thank you, Ian. Um, hello, everyone, and, and thanks very much for the opportunity to present today. As Ian said, I'm the Director of Agronomy for Incitec Pivot, and I'm based up here in Toowoomba. Um, I'm just going to give you a taste today of um, what IPF is doing to create innovative and, and new fertilisers, which we think will, will have a great benefit um, for the horticulture industry. I just want to get rid of that for a second. So um, everything we do is, is kind of underpinned by, by four principles um, regarding fertiliser, and that is um, use only what's needed, use it where it's needed, use it efficiently, and use it, don't lose it. So in terms of um, use only what's needed, it's, a, it's really about testing to understand your soil and so you can tailor fertilizer recommendations to your crop. Use it where it ne is needed it is about um, using precision ag agriculture and variable rate technology um, to really map and appropriately apply fertilizer. And the last two things are what I'm going to focus on today and that is about nutrient use efficiency um, and it's also about uh, using nutrients efficiently and quickly and sustainably. So um, at IPF, uh, we consider innovating um, really is our responsibility. And, and we're looking at ways um, to keep the industry ahead of the trends that we know are coming, particularly around sustainable environment. And, and those trends around improving soil health, reducing greenhouse gas, gases and reducing waste. So with this in mind, um, we have invested in Australian biofertilisers um, to introduce um, a new, more sustainable class of fertilisers, which are organo-mineral fertilisers. So essentially, we're taking an organic waste material and through a patented technology, we're combining that with mineral fertilisers and a carbon source to produce, um, uh, to combine it all to, for, to produce a uniform granule. And that granule is able to then be incorporated into your farming enterprise, your fertilizer programs with, with no requirement for capital outlay on your part. So it, so it behaves exactly the same way as a fertilizer granule would, um, a traditional fertilizer granule would. 
Um, the advantages of, of this process is, is what you end up with is a semi-recycled fertiliser product and, and one that um, is uh, pathogen free and, and low odour. And that just means that you've then got a product that you can use in a single pass. Um, and that is uh, an immense benefit um, for, for your farming enterprises. Um, we're pretty excited about this because um, we've been testing these products over a number of years. Oh, pardon me. We've been testing the, these products on farms over a number of years and um, the results are really encouraging. Um, and the results are showing um, at, at minimum the same uh, as current fertilizers, but we're also getting results that are much better than, than commercially available fertilizer pro, um, products at this stage. So it's really encouraging and we continue to work with farmers to, to test this product. As I'm sure you can imagine, um, do, <laughs> innovations like this uh, do take time and they tend to be an iterative pro, um, process. Um, but we are now at the point where we've had successful trials confirming the technology. We now have a pilot plant in operation and that pilot plant is able to produce product um, which we've been trialling and we've, which we've been able to get onto farm. Um, we're looking for to get a full scale commercial production um, ready in about 2025. We're hoping for earlier than that, but that's the, sort of the current time frame. And then a, a ramp up of production in 2027. Um, we are extremely excited about, about the products that we're producing. We have a whole range of them. I've just put a snapshot um, in the table on the right hand side of seven of the particular products. And you can see that they're um, there's a variation in their uh, nutrient analysis and we're going to continually develop those products and you'll see a, a whole range of them um, will come out of the ABF, um, ABF process. Um, I've put a link to the website there if you want to keep up to date um, with what's happening by all means and if you want to be considered um, as an earlier adopter of this technology, um, please feel free to visit the website um, and there's an inquiry form there that you can register your interest. Um, the other thing I just thought I'd touch on is enhanced efficiency fertilizers. And again, we're aiming to improve nutrient use efficiency and minimize nutrient losses and the associated greenhouse gas emissions that go with that. So um, we currently have um, two products that have been um, in the market a little, a little while um, because we know that um, reducing losses um, is going to be incredibly important in the future, not just um, because they represent an economic loss, but also for the, the greenhouse gas Im imprint they make. Um, so we have two, two products in, in the market already that are aimed at reducing volatilization and denitrification to two of the major losses that we find in, in nitrogen fertilizers. Um, but, but we are also um, very involved in, in developing the next generation of enhanced efficiency fertilizers. And we are part of um, the Australian Research Hub for Smart Fertilizers, which is a, um, a $15 million investment between the federal government, Melbourne University, La Trobe University, Elders and IPF. And really that investment is about generating the next um, lot of enhancing efficiency fertilizers. So that's about using um, engine, uh, material science to create engineered coatings to enable controlled release of nutrients. It's about generating new compounds that are going to inhibit urease and ammonia. Um, and those compounds will, are aimed at having improved stability and better handling and less variable performance in the current range. And also really doing some, some quite innovative research into how the soil and plant microbiome is influencing root physiology and the signals that sends for nitrogen acquisition. Um, so that um, is, is some really interesting science that we hope will generate the next 
um, round of EEFs. Um, I couldn't go past them without mentioning green ammonia. So um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just to say that really, if we want to um, cut emissions and get towards net zero, then green ammonia really is the step change we're going to need. So Intertech Pivot Fertilisers is partnering our expertise with Fortescue Future Industries um, to produce green ammonia at our Gibson Island facility here in Brisbane. Um, and so really we're at a, again at a pilot and feasibility stage. Um, we're building um, a plant, a small pilot plant at the moment and undertaking the technical and market feasibility. Um, look, initially um, we think that um, it'll be quite um, an expensive product, but like all of these green technologies, um, we can see that the product, um, the price of this sort of technology will come down over time. Um, but this is really where the step change in fertilizers will be. Um, and with that, um, seeing I think you need some time for questions, I might leave it there. But thank you again very much for, for allowing us to present. Thank you very much, Jan. A, a really fascinating uh, series of research and um, uh, product development steps you're going through there. Um, uh, look, we, we are running a, a smidge over, but I, I really wanted to include um, uh, Jan's uh, presentation in, in today's as well. So um, I, I think that's okay. And thank you for those who have hung around. We've still got very good uh, retention rates. So if any, all the presenters who are still here, uh, Benji's had to nip off, I'm afraid, he's got another meeting to get to. Um, for If everyone who's still here could turn their uh, cameras back on. Um, and uh, th there haven't really had too many questions come through uh, during the presentations. Um, I think probably because people like me were too busy taking notes. Um, uh, get, one question from an anonymous attendee was uh, whether Animed was organic certified. Gary, you've answered that, that um, it's going through the uh, cert process at the moment and it's one to two months away. Um, I, 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 we haven't really had any other. So for those who are still there, if you'd like to throw a question up now, otherwise we can probably uh, wrap it up where we are. I'd like to extend... Um, uh, my big thanks to everyone presenting today. Um, uh, a, uh, a poll will appear on the uh, your screen in a moment. We'd really love it if it'd be, we could get some feedback on that because it'll help us uh, plan topics for the future. We're hoping to run more of these more regularly. Um, thank you for putting that up, Greta. Um, and it'd be a great um, help if you could fill that out. But while you are, I've just sort of got a, a bit more of a general question for... Uh, the group in terms of where you see smart farming technology advancements in more environmentally friendly technology moving within within the private sector what what do you need from growers what sort of engagement do you need from growers to uh help you better produce the products that you want to produce that are going to be more tailored to their needs um maybe just uh, stick your hand up or, or, or turn your mic on and just um make it a bit of a free-for-all if um if anybody has any opinions on that yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, um, we're developing the technology to solve farmer problems. So we we like to work very closely with farmers and, and get their direct feedback on, on the product, on where it might be suitable, where it's not, um, so that we can tailor what we're doing. So um, we welcome all, all feedback and, and engagement. And obviously, with products like ours, we need we need to conduct field trials at a, at a reasonable commercial scale. So we're always looking for enthusiastic collaborators. And we have had a question just quickly for you, Jan. Um, uh, when are you expecting green ammonia, uh, green ammonia production to commence? Uh, um, that one, I don't know. It's a little way off. We're only at um, the feasibility stage at the moment. So um, not for the next little while anyway. Not commercial at commercial scale anyway. Um, uh, Gary, can uh, Justin Capadonna has asked, can uh, Ento... Entomopathogen agents transmitted across adult insect are be transmitted across adult insects, or is it just the immature stages? Oh, it's all stages, yeah. So in the case of entomopathogenic fungi, yeah, it's, it's across all, all life stages. Um, with the NPVs, with the nuclear polyhedrous viruses, it's um, it's um, it's more in the L1, L2 they're in, um, infected. But with, with helic, helicobacs, 
it will affect those larger instars, and that's where you get that um, epizootal effect of um, the they climb actually climb to the top of the plant, and it's like they they become like zombies that want to go to the light, and that's that's the virus sort of trying to replicate itself. It needs to get to the top of the crop. So then that spreads the virus further. It's really interesting actually with how it, how it impacts the um, uh, human converter in particular with that process. Cool. Uh, Scott, you, uh, you turned your, uh, you, yourself off mute. Did you have an answer to the initial question in terms of uh, industry engagement and developing smarter and greener technologies? Yeah, um, I guess with respect to the technology that I've presented, um, any sort of engagement that comes through the research interest part of the industry is always going to be helpful um, and that's a sector that we would always be happy to chat to directly so if anything is sort of uh, stimulated or directed through that area it would be brilliant to do that but also then just hearing I guess the collection of issues that um, growers and also I guess your, your big distributors get at their levels that may be accommodated by this technology. Thank you. Just, a, just a comment from me, sorry. And I'm really interested, Scott, um, in its application in protected cropping. Um, sure, yeah. you know, the cool room situation, but, but pulling um, pathogens out of the actual protected crop um, is an interesting concept. And I guess ethylene also plays a role in flower production. So, you know, its utilisation in that space in protected cropping would be really interesting. Yeah, so look, what I can say in that area is it would be, absolutely fledgling in terms of bringing it into that environment but the interest is certainly there and there's certainly a lot of talk throughout various forum internet circles regarding ethylene in uh, protected cropping now we've just finished 16 weeks of trial which is ending tomorrow actually literally um, in a cannabis growing facility here in Queensland so they um, approached us a little while ago and we facilitated the use of two of the units for two separate purposes. Uh, one is in a seedling room and then the other is in a, a drying and a processing room um, in terms of dealing with airborne pathogens. So I'll be happy if they allow me to, to pass all of that information on to you. There's also, I guess, discussion of what happens inside protective cropping once you start removing, say, fruits or removing buds or things like that from uh, plants, if you've got different stages of plants present in the same room, so if there is a bit of a stimulus of ethylene production because you're starting to harvest at one end, creating issues in stem, stunt of growth and failings with your, your you know, younger generation plants, um, and I think there's a world of research that can be done there with this technology. Uh, Owen, you, um, you, you had something to say? Oh, yeah, just, just picking up on the, the comment about the whole ag tech space and digital transformation. Look, it's all about the producer. And um, the, uh, certainly the horticulture innovation project was a, a terrific example of spending a lot of time listening and, um, and, and giving the producers the, the opportunity, even when it comes to the user interface design, uh, to, to let us know, you know what, what, what is required and to show and then listen and, and, and come back and improve. So uh, absolutely the, the producers are part of it. And, and it's not a onerous engagement. Uh, I think all, all of us in the tech space are, are fully cognizant of time pressures and um, yeah, just whatever time we can get, you know, certainly the ag tech industry is listening. And, and do you have a, a, a most of the products uh, whether they've been given are on the market now or been given a timeline to market? Do, do you have a, a, any concept of a timeline to market for the control tower platform yet? We, we, we're now at the stage together with uh, Horticulture Innovation Australia of, of commercialising, you know, going into that commercial phase, looking at, at what it'll take to, uh, to take it beyond the, the space where we're currently operating. So it, it's, it's pretty imminent. Fantastic. All right. Look, um, uh, just one more quick question we can do for Gary, which is what are the risks of those bioviruses to potentially escape the target pest and impact beneficial insects? Yeah, look, in the case of the Bavaria bassiana, yeah, that's 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 potentially a challenge, but they are quite selective also in that, in that um, they're, they're 
that particular strain has been selected to have the least impact on beneficials. So, yes, it is less selective than the NPVs, the, the viruses, but still uh, quite soft on the key beneficials. Fantastic. Well, look, given that uh, we're starting to uh, lose people and no more questions are coming in, although we've still got 50 people who you've held their attention, um, uh, fantastic turnout today to everybody who came. It was um, uh, probably a testament to the uh, draw power of, uh, of your particular industry statuses. Um, but we had, a, I think we topped out at a 110 people there. Um, I'll ask my, my colleague, Gret, to close the... Um, uh, to Greta to close the um, uh, poll down now. Thank you. Um, this is the second in a series of uh, um, uh, three webinars. Uh, the next one will be held on the 24th of November and we'll be looking at a uh, focus on analysing changes in markets, cost of inputs and climate over the last 12 months and look at what forecasting tools exist currently to help prepare you for the coming year. Uh, you get anybody who's registered for this or a previous AVIS event will get an invite to that in uh, tomorrow. And uh, I thank you all for joining us. And I especially thank the five of you and Benji uh, for your time today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, as soon as we close the webinar, you'll all get kicked out. So I won't get a chance to say goodbye afterwards, but I'll probably send you an email and give you a call. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ian. Cheers.